So, um, Coach Nick Penn, the way this works is I'll moderate for you. Um, obviously, you guys know the deal at this point. Go ahead and raise your hand in the participant function, and we'll work through it, and uh, and we'll go from there. So, um, we're going to start off with Dina, who obviously is always getting the first question. So, um, go ahead, Dina. Hey, Coach. Thanks hey, for Dix. being on today. Hope you're doing well. Uh, my question is, in, we know you have Chad Surratt and Jeremiah G Gimmel back at linebacker. What player do you think has a uh, shot at being that third possible linebacker? <laughs> it's, um, you know, I only have um, six total that's on scholarship, uh, Miss King. I got, uh, you know, Kadri Jackson, Asante, um, as well as the two young boys that came in uh, with West and Gray. So I, I don't know anything about how, they, how, they, how they're how they doing right now as far as, you know, the football part because we didn't get a chance to go through spring with them. But I tell you what, I, I'm very encouraged uh, with Asante as well as Kadri. Uh, both of those guys are they, – they do the same thing to the, as, um, as a Surratt and a, uh, and a Gimmel. You know, Gimmel is super fast and super smart, and I think Kadri has that same attribute. And then Asante is just – he is so fast. I mean, we think that Chaz is the – Eugene, um, he gives us a dimension that we don't have on our football team at speed. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, which one of those guys evolved. It would have been great to get him in the spring just to see who could uh, – who would have been the chance to step up. You know, last year we played with a lot of three linebackers with D. Ross on the field, and that kind of changed our football team when he, when he came out. Uh, so we're going to experiment, you know, especially on third down uh, with, with, with Eugene and Kadri, you know, because the, both of those guys deserve uh, to get some playing time this year. Anything to follow with, Dan? Uh, no, I'm good. Thanks. Andrew Jones, go ahead. Hey, Coach. Appreciate you coming on with us. Uh, when you – now that you've had a chance to see Mac – Anytime. The, you got it? Go ahead, Andrew. Okay. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay. Now that you've had a chance to see Mac go through a full season and a full recruiting cycle, it's sort of a two-part question here. What have you seen from him that is a lot different than what you experienced a long time ago as a player? And have, are there, have there been a few moments where you've thought to yourself, hey, I remember that. I remember being on the other end of hearing that or receiving that back in the day. Oh, good question. I'll tell you what, um, when I was at 18 and 19 years old, his message hasn't changed. Uh, and i tell you what, I, you know, as a, as a player and being a coach, you know, you never saw the side, you know, when you were the player on how he interacted with the, with the coaches. As a player, you knew that Mac had your best interest at heart, on and off the football field. And he always had that caring touch. Um, cared about you, what you, you know, with all parts of your life, cared about your parents. As you know, this is my first time ever working with Coach as an adult. You know, but he's been he's been with me ever since I started uh, started coaching twenty something years ago, and then being with him and just seeing how structured and organized he is, and uh, you know the division he, he has a vision on exactly what he wants to get done. It's it's, it's truly like if you ever got a head coaching job, I think the, the blueprint is exactly what he does uh, from from the notes. And Jeremy will tell you that everything is. Is, is really coordinated and organized. Uh, so it's not by accident as we're, that we're doing well in recruiting as well as, you know, as, as, as playing on getting uh, the new facilities, um, the, uh, the, uh, the facilities part of it, then the crowd size of it, the new marketing, that's all Matt. You know, and Matt does a great job with that. That's the part I didn't see as a player was on how he interacted with the, with the organization of the team. And it's truly professional. I think ESPN, when he won the chance to work with ESPN, you know, that, that gives you a chance to really, really get a chance to, uh, um, you know, make, uh, get your better, make you better as far as, as speaking. He was always a dynamic speaker and, uh, and had a really charismatic. I think when he went to ESPN, you know, and capturing an audience, capturing an audience, how do you hold, you know, uh, 10, 15 million people to, to not turn a channel? I think he's mastered that because every time he speaks, the players, the coaches, the organization, everybody around the organization, we're all tuned in to everything he says. And it's always different, and he's always changing it up. Uh, but as a, so to answer your question, as a player, I mean, players from when I from twenty something years ago, they've always loved him. 
And as coaches now, you know, you can really admire the way he uh, is he, the way he leads and motivates the football team. Thank you. All right, we'll go to Sammy. Go ahead, Sammy. Hold on a second. Are you trying to unmute yourself? Hi. Uh, yeah. Tell me, if I'm right, you, you were recruiting a Mac after one of those one in 10 seasons. I mean, he must have really did a great selling job for you. What, was there a moment during your recruitment that despite that one in 10, what Mac said was just impressed you so much you wanted to be part of all that? Oh, no doubt. So remember, I wasn't from the East Coast. I was from Arkansas. So my last two years, my last two years of high school were in Northern Virginia. Um, you know, back in those days, man, there wasn't a 247. There wasn't a uh, Rivals Top 100. It wasn't any of that. Um, I knew one thing. I knew when I came out of high school, um, they, they, they sent me from Arkansas to go live with my dad because I needed some discipline. And so I go from a 1.9 to like a 4.0 just by moving environments, okay? And so when I got to uh, Northern Virginia to be with my dad, when the recruitment started, you know, all I knew was this. I knew I wasn't ever going to go back to Arkansas. And, I, and the only person that actually was talking to me about life after football was – and all he kept saying was, hey, you know, when you get done with football, you'll always have a job. I'll always, I'll always make phone calls for you um, 20 years after you're done with, 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 with football. Uh, you have a relationship with me for the rest of your life. And so with those coaches, and then when I came out of high school, coaches were telling me, okay, yeah, you go to the pros, you play three years, you leave, you know, all they kept preaching was NFL. At that time, that was not was the farthest thing from my mind. All I knew was I wanted to get a degree, I wanted to have a great job, and I did not want to go back and live in the South. And he was the one guy that, that sold my family from the get-go. It wasn't just about football. It was about life after the football element. And that's what stuck it out. My dad, when, when he left Matt, he said, I've never met anybody that's like that man. And I, I got a great feeling about him. He said, don't worry about the one in 10 record. You say, you know, if you go to school there and you change your program, people always remember that. And so that was the one thing that stuck out about, about Coach Brown was the fact that he had, he, had, he had promised me and my family that I would get a degree. I knew I could play football, so that I wasn't worried about that. But the fact that he said, I'll take care of you for the rest of your life, that's what stuck in my mind. And when I talk to the 18-year-olds and today, I tell them the same thing. Not, you're gonna, not Everybody going to preach football to you, but not many. That, but there'll be two or three people in your life that say they're going to they're gonna keep their word to you, especially when they're done and your football career is over with. And that was Coach Brown. Anything to follow with, Sammy? Yeah, I was just wondering, are there any similarities to the rebuild that you guys are going through now as to when you were a player? Because you, you Yeah, I mean, yeah, because you remember now we did we did back to back one in ten seasons. They were right on top of each other, you know. But the message never changed. He never you know, most times when somebody go one in ten, usually if you go one in ten the second year, you're fired in, in college football today. But Matt never changed. You never knew he was stressed, you never knew he was under duress, and you never felt the pressure. You know, most people, when they feel that second year of pressure on them, it, it you know, it kind of projects onto the players. But not one time did he, was he ever erratic with the football players. I never remember him ever being out of his element. You know, so for us, I, I saw same thing from last year. You know, I never saw a coach out of his element. So as a player, I saw that. And here I am, you know, 20-some years later as an adult. And, and here we are, you know, we, we start off season pretty good and we have a little bumpy road. But his message never, ever changed. And how did he fix it? From We go from 1 and 10, and then, you know, the next year we went 6-4-1, then 7-4, then 9-3. and, uh, nine and three. So it was just a constant progress of the football team. So you're seeing the same thing again now. What he did do was kept bringing in better and better football players. And that's the cure-all. You keep bringing in better football players, your program is going to change. And then having that, having that culture where the kids stay around and they keep promoting your program, that's that was that's the, that's the difference. So you see the recruiting has now changed. You see that the better players that's on the board now we have to develop them uh, so that so we can uh, each week you know or each year build up on the progress that we made from the year before. Greg Barnes, go ahead. Hey Tommy, uh, by hey, the Greg. end of you doing all right, but by, by the end of last year. 
Uh, Chaz Surratt and Jeremiah Gimmel were you know, solid contributors to the defense. But this time last year, they were relative unknowns, especially Chaz, having been a you know, quarterback. What, what was your approach uh, in coaching those guys up, knowing that you had limited options there in the middle uh, and trying to get them ready for, for that season opener? Well, you don't have a draft, <laughs> so it's, it's what you got, you know. Um, and one thing about football, you, you just you just stay on the message, you know. You you, you just – I stay consistent with them, uh, and we just kept doing the same drills over and over and over and over again. What, what, what set both of those young men apart was how smart they are. I mean, extremely intelligent football players and high-character football guys. So football is important to both of them. And they were smart and they were tough. All they needed to do was just the more experience they got, the better they were going to become. I saw that in both of them. You know, Chaz, for me, Chaz got a different kind of speed. He's big, he's fast, and he's super cerebral. That's what people don't understand. That Chaz, you tell him something one time, and that's it. And same thing with Jeremiah Gimmel. And so both those young guys gave us an element of speed that I, that, I, that I know I didn't have when I was at Tennessee or at Auburn. They were both faster linebackers than the ones that I had. All they needed was experience and it just stay consistent with the messaging. So to watch them both grow, especially Chaz, you remember the South Carolina game just okay. But then by the end of the season, you know, he started to, to, buy, to, to really uh, build onto his image of who he was as a football player. I mean, now he's starting to talk to talking to the D lineman on, you know, what to expect. So he's changed a lot as a football player. And uh, that's what I did see, the fact that their care factor was really high. They loved the game, and their teammates respected them. And so for them to keep getting better and better each, year, each week, we never got downed on them. We never yelled or, or, berated, or you know, berated the player. We kept encouraging them. And that's the way that, that when, I, when Coach Brown was uh, with me in that, those years in the uh, 90s, that's how I built as a player. He kept being positive with me. So, as a, you know, as a result, that's my coaching style. Stay positive, keep the message going, and you just keep drilling it. And the fact that both those guys could run and they were smart, uh, it wasn't by accident they, per, they turned into uh, productive football players. Well, great. Give, given that growth curve that they went through last year, kind of where's their next step? I mean, do you think you can put a lot more on them? Had you kind of pared back some just to kind of make it easier on them? Or no, you can that? put – with both those, I mean, the, the more you put on them, the better. Because, you know, what you don't want them is become stagnant. The more we can do with those young men – you know, bringing Chaz off the edge or – I mean, you can be really, really creative with both of them because they, they, their knowledge of football is outstanding. And so for us, you know, give them more so they don't get bored of the game, challenging them more. And uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll take to that, you know. So um, both those young guys, I mean, they, they love knowledge. They love to write the game down and play it in their minds. Uh, so the more we can do – now, you just still, you know, it's nine more guys that are on the football field, so – it won't be just them, so it's going to be the whole defense as a collective on how much the whole defense can handle. All right, Ross, go ahead. Hey, Coach, you, know, you came in with a reputation as a recruiter. And I think, you know, I don't know if that's what you believe, but you have the reputation as a really good recruiter in the SEC, Tennessee, and now at UNC. What is your technique in, in recruiting a kid from, from when you offer and get to know the kid to how you kind of close in on a prospect and eventually get them to sign. What do you do as a recruiter? Uh, each one is a. I think as, I, as I've gone, I kind of you kind of pull from a different 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 personalities. So from you know, I, I was with Butch for five years at Tennessee, and he had a uh, you know he had he had a great marketing mentality. You know, Gene Chiswick, you know, had that SEC mentality of. Alabama was always lurking, you know. Then I was at North Carolina with Bunning and, and uh, Butch. And so you kind of got the organization from from Butch. And then from Mac, you know, from Mac you get kind of everything, from marketing to uh, being charismatic with the kids and then to, to making sure you uh, uh, talk to everybody that the kid is has touched. So the, the philosophy changes with each recruit. Uh, I think the one thing I've learned now, probably as i got gotten older more than anything else, is when to cut bait and leave, you know. That was, that was the one thing I struggled at when I was a young recruiting coach was the fact that you got so deep into recruiting that you didn't know when to cut and walk away from it when you knew in your pit that the kid had other intentions. You know what I mean? So that's the one thing that I've gotten as I've gotten older, when to move on to another player because you don't know who's going to be the best player in football 
you know, you saw in the draft that probably, what, 17 five-stars got drafted, but then you saw the three-stars and the two-stars dominated the drafting. So you really can't predict the human development part of it. So, you know, you don't know who's going to be a good football player. You just got to find the one that can fit your system. And so what I've learned the most is, okay, when do I move on? When do I move on and go on to the next kid so I don't end up with the fourth or fifth best player? Uh, the one thing I, I love to do in this game is still – because the philosophy has changed a little bit because of with the social media deal. You know, the kids now used to be, okay, if you had the mom and you had the dad, it was 100% you'd get the kid. You know, now the kids kind of – some kids are a little bit different because the way the parents talk to the kid who's – especially the five-star player, you know, the kid now becomes uh, the one that the parents are listening to. So each one of them is, has a little bit different um, uh, take on how you recruit them. And, but you just got to still find out the personality. It's still a, it's still a sociology game uh, in my mind. It's still a chess match. So let him uh, ask that question again and kind of let you get going. Yeah, uh, Coach, I was asking kind of like your technique in recruiting kids. Uh, we heard about what the other schools you've done. Jeremy, I can't hear anything that anybody's saying. So you can't hear me? Oh, I got you now, yeah. Ross, go Jeremy. ahead. Yeah, hey, Coach. Um, yeah, just I was asking about, you know, what you do in particular for yourself as a recruiter. You mentioned kind of the programs you've been at, and you had gotten into kind of um, cutting bait with kids. And I think that's about where it cut off with you. Yeah. What's the question, Ross? Um, what makes you a good recruiter? What, what have you done? What have you learned um, to become a good recruiter and earn that reputation? And you mentioned cutting bait, and that's kind of where you cut off earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, just read how you read a room. You know what I mean? You, will, uh, you can walk into a room now, and that's, I think that's what I've gotten good at is, is fact, walking into a room, man, and then just looking at the dynamics and, you know, what's the kids? Is he giving you eye contact? Is he leaning towards you? Is his feet moving? You know what I mean? Does his eyes look at that door, which means he wants you to walk out that door. So I got a chance to start, start studying, you know, body movements and, you know, kids that clam up or walk out the room. You know, there, there's a lot of things that they can show you in the interest part of it. Uh, then just as far as the communication, you know, in today's game, if they like you, Ross, they going to keep communicating with you. You know, it's, it's kind of like the dating scene. If I got to call her and text her every single time, when I was single, and you know what? Some, she's reached out to somebody, <laughs> you know what I mean? So in this game, Ross, if they're communicating back to you and you communicate Kate, back to them, and it's both, both on a mutual deal, I, I text him and out the blue, he texts me, hey, coach, what's going on? That kid has legitimate interest, you know? If every time I got to reach out and, and, and call and text him, then you know what? He's calling somebody else, you know? He's reaching out to somebody, so. That's what I was saying before is even when you start the contact part of it and get a chance to see them in person, if we can get it down to two 50-50, 50-50 Ross, then I think we have – Carolina always have a legitimate shot of getting the kids. Go ahead, Ross. Yeah, I can't relate to much of that dating stuff. But um, in, terms <laughs> of, in terms of Charlotte, y'all have, have had great coverage in the state of North Carolina. How has Charlotte you, – you've seen change in the last two years with Mac? You're recruiting in Charlotte and landing those kids and kind of really getting more Tar Heel commits from the Queen City. If, if you remember, Ross, when, okay, and, and this was, um, there used to be, okay, uh, there was always the, the talk, if you control the East, you know, the East, I always heard about who's got the East, you know, and that was down, uh, down in, you know, Jacksonville and uh, that area down there. Everybody was always talking about the East. But it's changed a lot. When I was here um, in 2005 to 2009, which wasn't very long ago, Ross. Uh, if you remember, man, it was only about four or five players a year, Ross, that was coming out of Charlotte. That's not many at all. And even when I was a player at Carolina, I just don't remember many kids coming out of Charlotte. Like, well, I think we had Reggie Clark, and that may have been the only player on our football team was from the Queen City. But if you look at it now, and, and how, how, how the dynamics have changed, you know, with Charlotte being one of the fastest growing cities in the country, you know, like 80-something people a day are moving there. A lot of those manufacturing jobs on the east have, have, you know, closed down. A lot of people have moved from the east over to Charlotte. So now you see Charlotte's producing, man, 20, 25 players a year now that are, that are signing Power 5 scholarships. So that's changed a lot. So 
the philosophy goes like this between the Gastonia area and the Charlotte area and the Concord area, you can get, you know, 10, 11 players on your football team from that area. And if you control that area, which is the biggest area in, in the state, you control that area, you control the messaging. And then that way, if you, if you control Charlotte, you control North Carolina. And if you win the state of North Carolina in recruiting, you'll be in the ACC in the championship. Good, Ross. Great. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Ken, we're back to you. Coach, I'm going to stick with recruiting. You mentioned a little bit uh, on Ross's question. Uh, been recruiting North Carolina for a long time with uh, Auburn and Tennessee, and now your second time with UNC. What have you seen talent wise change in? kids from North Carolina. You guys have done got 13 commits uh, from North Carolina this in the class of 21. So what's what's a little bit different than the last time uh, yeah. he was at Chapel Hill? Just the, the fact that the recruiting never stops. You know, during the football season, you study, you study offering kids. And we've offered a lot of kids that are, you know, from this class here, we offered a bunch of these kids two years ago. You know what I mean? As far as the early offering and, and jumping out early. One thing that they'll hurt you with today is if you don't offer them early, you know, when they're in 10th grade, you're, you're out of it if they're, if they're a good football player. They could put, easily put you out and you find you, I mean, and then the word travels so fast. That's kind of the difference now is the word, you know, if you don't offer a kid and he's got an offer from Alabama or Auburn and you hadn't offered him yet, you know, he's, he's communicating to other kids that, you know, hey, North Carolina ain't going to offer you. So the thing that we've done differently here is we've put the early offers out. I think what we've done also different is the fact that we, we you know, coach makes it an emphasis to have relationships with all coaches in this state. And we talk, we have to talk to every single one of them, regardless if they got a player or not. And so when the player is coming up, we are getting heads up. Hey, here's a kid down the pipeline. And I think he's going to be a good football player. You guys need to offer early. So I think that's one thing we've done that's, that's been, been a little bit different as far as getting those early offers out and start recruiting those guys a whole lot earlier. As far as the difference between the ACC and the SEC, it's, you know, I mean, here, I don't hear so much of the SEC when I'm over in North Carolina. Yeah, Tennessee may try to tiptoe over here. Auburn try to tiptoe. But for the most part, you know, only about one or two players uh, that are actually going to the SEC. I don't hear as much as when I was in the SEC at Tennessee on how much I had to hear about Georgia and Alabama and Auburn. Uh, here, the culture is still ACC. Good. Gregory Hall, you're up. Coach, what surprised you about your defense uh, last season? Uh, I tell you what, it did. I thought every week they got better and better, just the progress of them and how comfortable they got. Uh, one thing that I did notice, me and JB talked about this a lot. JB has a great football mind, and because it, it looks like we do so much on defense to offense, it paralyzes a lot of offenses. And I think our kids start to feel that you know what, we're only going to see about 10, 11 plays. And then once they mastered those 10, 11 plays, they became really dominant. I thought at the end of the season, man, we played Temple, we played NC State. I thought we were playing as good a defense as anybody in the country. And I would have loved to play anybody at that time of the season. Uh, so, you know, you know, with this uh, corona thing going on now, you know, I hope to God we're able to get back on track and play this season because I think our kids – have a whole different type of confidence. And it took us a minute to get there. You know, it was a lot of, you know, oh, here we go again. You know, when we lost the game to uh, Clemson or we lost to a Pittsburgh or Virginia, it was that doubt that, you know, those doubts of, you know, we, we're going to lose a close game like we did the season before. I think by the end of the season, they found the ways to win the, the tight games and started to believe that they're a really dominant football team. And uh, that, that Temple game really showed it. And I thought that NC State game really showed it. And I think that, you know, from here on out, I think our kids now know that they can play with anybody in the country. Anything to follow up with, Gregory? What does it need to prove on moving to this next season as the team as a whole tries to become that consistent top 25 program? What does your defense need to improve upon from last season to be yeah, to I mean, that next level? Just to make sure that you know, for us, it's never it's – never, you know, it's, it's, it's always going to be fits, you know, make sure you fit plays right and don't give up big plays. You know, we always say, okay, what do you need to work on? Okay, let's work on 
we work on the red zone and short yardage. Those are, I know those are two emphasis, especially by our head coach, that we need to emphasize on. This was teams get in the red zone, keep them from scoring touchdown and holding the field goals. That's one thing we can do a whole lot better. And then uh, just making sure that, you know, when you bust, if you bust a play, you know, you got to make sure it's at a minimum game. You know, the fact that we don't let the ball, let nobody throw the ball over our head or misfit play. So for us, it's just, again, the consistency of it, you know, being consistent. And I thought last season, that's what we did a great job of. Uh, we, we simplified it, let the kids play what they had their strengths to. Uh, and then, you know, you got older. This is an older football team, so, of course, we can do a lot more on defense. We got experience in the secondary. We got experience at the linebacker position. Uh, we got to grow, you know, the defensive line. We got some old guys like Fox and uh, Jaleel Taylors of the world, but we got to keep growing that position. Good. Andrew Jones, go ahead. Hey, Coach, um, aside from not being able to be face-to-face -face with any of the kids during the shutdown, what's been the biggest challenge in recruiting during this time period? And is there something maybe that you've learned during this process that you might use more once the norm is restored? The biggest challenge is just not being able to see them. You know, we've, you know, you're going from soon as the spring ball or spring game was over with, was walking into schools and seeing the kids of, you know, especially in the, in the sudden springtime, of kids being able to go out there and practice spring ball. We're fortunate enough this year, we got, we got a lot of players in state. You know, if this was next year, the way it doesn't seem like those number is big, it would have been quite, it would have been quite a challenge because now you got to go to other people's state to try to get recruits and you can't see them. So the, our, biggest, our, biggest, uh, uh, our biggest asset has been the fact that our, our state got a lot of football players this year. Um, so for us, it's a, lot, it's a lot better. But, you know, it's hard to offer those. I'll tell you what's the, probably the, the most difficult thing is right now is the 22 class and the 23 class, you know, of identifying who the young guys are going to be that's going to be up and coming and then trying to get those guys offered because you haven't seen them, you hadn't seen them in person. And you hadn't seen them go through spring ball or go through the weight room or get the chance to grab your transcripts from school. So that's the biggest challenge is identifying for the 22 and 23 classes. This year class, we already got 14 already committed. And uh, man, we only got four or five more scholarships. So we, we're ahead of the curve in that sense. And it's been really good because all we got to do now is just keep communicating, and keep having a great relationship with the coaches and, and the people that surround them. Um, but we got to get We got to get ahead on the 22, 23 class. Yeah, and, and the other part, what have you, what have you learned maybe that you've used in recruiting the last six or seven weeks to enforce Just that? Still, that, right, that still you might actually take with you. Pardon me? Right. The one thing you've learned is it's still, it's still about communicating. You know, you still got to have communication. I mean, for us, I mean, it's, it's easy to, to fall into your own little uh, trap of, okay, this is what I'm doing every single day. But now you have a chance to actually talk to them a whole lot more than you had in the past. You know, because you're sitting around, and I can say, hey, give me a call real quick. You know, like I'm, I'm sitting around with some recruits, and, okay, one guy that we recruited, he loves to cook. He loves cooking. So, hey, okay, hey, FaceTime me and show me how you what you're cooking, and then he'll share recipes with me. So there's a lot of different, you know, there's one guy that's uh, his dad's a coach, and he's, uh, uh, you know, he's talking football with me. Uh, so, you know, far, as far as the, 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 you know, the talking and the communication is ramped up a whole lot more than it had been. You know, if we were in spring ball or something, you know, of course, we'd be having house, we had practices and the film evaluations. And then if you were out there practicing, you know, you about, if the kids were out there practicing, you'd be watching their practices, coming back to your uh, hotel room at nighttime, trying to catch up on the phone calls. So it's different now because you just got time. And that's, that's, you can do two things. You can do nothing or you can maximize the time with, you know, with recruiting and uh, evaluations and calling, trying to find out who's the 22 kids. Sammy, you're up. Go ahead. Yeah, Tommy, I'm from Fayetteville, which, I, which produced two of your former teammates, Marcus Wall and Bracey Walker. Two, two pretty guys. Uh, in your mind, who was tougher, Nova Kane or Supernat? Who was the other one? Marcus Wall and Bracey Walker. Oh, no, it ain't even close. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bracey. Bracy, man, he goes down as the you know the all time one of the all time great safeties that we've had. I mean, he is. I mean, he what ended up playing ten, maybe eleven years in the NFL. 
Yeah. Now Marcus pound for pound, you know, man for man, and he was he was pretty tough, but he didn't he didn't never knock himself unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what Bracey would do. When Bracey would knock himself senseless, you know, you know, put some water on his head and then go right back out there. So it, it, not many come like him. I mean, he is the ultimate warrior, probably one of the all-time toughest football players that ever come through North Carolina, in my opinion. Thanks, Tommy. Yes, sir. All right, gang. I don't see any more hands raised. Does that mean we're we're good? Does anybody else need anything? Getting some thumbs up and some head nods. So. Uh, <laughs> Big Pen, appreciate Thank you. Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Sorry, we had our technical difficulties, but but.